Welcome to the Nonprofit Show. We are so glad you're here. This Thank is a you. dedicated week. It's a special, unique week that we get to spend. This is actually our third annual Nonprofit Power Week with the team of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. So we are thrilled to have with us Kicking off this week on a Monday, or as I like to call it, a Monday, because <laughs> Friday gets all the fun and we really need to start Monday off with, with fun as well. Julianne Nichols, and Julianne serves as the Vice President, Marketing and Communications at the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. And she's brought to us a topic that we don't talk about often enough, and it's about changing minds, in particular with researching and changing attitudes. Stay with us. Julianne's going to introduce herself in just one moment, but if we haven't met you yet, we always like to remind you that we are here, uh, Julia Patrick and myself, Jarrett Ransom, serving alongside as co-host here for the Nonprofit Show. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for our amazing presenting sponsors, so thank you so very much for the Kind support, not only for us, but truly for the sector at large, for all of the 1.8 million nonprofits that are registered. So thank you to Fundraising Academy at National University, Bloomerang, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, American Nonprofit Academy. Also, thank you to Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Again, these companies have been with us, most of them from the very beginning, marching towards our 1,000th episode which you can find all of these episodes on the various streaming platforms. You can download the app and find us there, streaming broadcast as well as podcast. So pretty much wherever you binge watch or binge listen to your entertainment, you just go ahead and queue up the nonprofit show. You will be glad that you did. There are tons, tons of episodes there at your disposal so again, as we kick off this Monday, we are thrilled for it to be a nonprofit power week. Again, Julianne Nichols is joining us as vice president marketing as well as communications at the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Welcome to you, Julianne. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be with both of you today and just want to say thank you so much um, for giving us the opportunity to share a bit about um, the foundation's mission and a number of different topics with you this week. It's important to us year round and extra special in November because it is um, National Adoption Month. And that's a time that we shine a light on you know families growing through adoption and the urgent need for foster care adoption um, in particular. Um, and so, you know, as you, you know, and we've shared with um, your listeners in the past, we're um, a national nonprofit public charity that is committed to um, dramatically increasing the number of adoptions of children um, waiting in foster care, you know, across the United States and Canada. And, and so, as you mentioned, um, I'm the vice president of marketing and communications, and I lead a team of marketing and communications and graphic design professionals. And, and we wear um, a number of hats um, in terms of supporting departments within the organization that lead um, a number of our um, strategic priority areas and really work to um, raise public awareness um, of our mission and, and the cause of foster care adoption in a number of ways. Um, and um, research has been, um, you know, a key part of that, a part of our strategic priorities from the very beginning of um, when um, Dave Thomas, who was the founder of Wendy's Restaurants um, and who was adopted, um, created um, this important foundation um, to be a national voice for the cause um, and, you know, um, support families growing this way. Um, through a number of initiatives. And, and again, research has been a key part of that. Um, and so I'm happy to share a couple examples today. Well, it, it's an interesting thing because I think a lot of times, Julianne and Jarrett and I see this every single day on the nonprofit show, that a lot of us come to the world of service in the nonprofit sector with a passion and a sensibility that we don't often back up with research. It's just a passion that we're like, everybody should feel this way. Everybody should know about this. Everybody should get yep. involved. Um, but I'm really interested to find out how you look at this and using this research model to, to move forward. Talk to us about that. Sure. Um, so again, I'm going to give you a couple of different examples. And, um, and the first one, um, you know, um, really is about the evidence base of your work. You know, so, you know, we, um, again, the roots of who we are as an organization is about um, 
advocacy and raising public awareness and that there are research components that I'll talk about that are part of that. But um, our president and CEO, Rita Sornan, in the early 2000s also wanted to create a program um, that was more direct service. Um, and so we developed a program called Wendy's Wonderful Kids, mm -hmm. and um, it worked to um, uh, support the funding of adoption professionals who would serve the longest waiting children in foster care. Um, and using um, what we refer to as a child-focused recruitment model that focuses on finding the right family for every child. And we, we felt good about the results that we were seeing, um, but we wanted to you know, make sure. And so we um, engaged a research partner to do a rigorous national um, five-year evaluation of that program. Wow. And yeah. Um, and among the findings, um, we we learned that um, children who are referred to that program are, are up to um, three times more likely to be adopted. So that was critical research that um, we began sharing, you know, through reports on our website, um, you know, highlights to the media, um, you know, evidence to inform the training that we provided to adoption professionals and working with partners in the field and really to develop a business plan that would scale that program um, to make sure that there would be enough adoption professionals to see um, to serve the number of children um, waiting. And so that's an example of kind of that outcome base that can is really important um, for nonprofits who are, you know, um, either, you know, funding or leading a cause that advances their mission. Um, another example I'll share that's a bit more audience specific. So, um, you know, Dave Thomas, you know, also was, you know, a huge advocate and reaching out to business leaders to say, you know, um, you're providing benefits to families who are um, um, having a child biologically, but what about um, parents who are considering, you know, becoming a foster or adoptive parent? Why wouldn't you provide, you know, the same benefits? Um, and so we started conducting a, a research survey um, encouraging employers to share, you know, what type of um, paid leave and financial benefits were they offering to um, employers? And so um, for the last, actually last week, um, we released the 17th annual survey of what we call the best adoption friendly workplaces. Um, and it reveals kind of, you know, what are those best practices so that we can um, encourage other employers to do the same and inform their policies and developing like a tool, an employer toolkit of resources that, that helps them um, to inform their practices. Um, yeah. A third example I'll share, um, and this really gets to the public research question that you asked in terms of attitudes, um, is called our um, Adoption and Foster Care Attitude Survey. And um, so, you know, this research, what I'm about to share, parts of it are not ours, but we know from other research resources that, you know, every year more than um, 20,000 youth age out of foster care without a family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know that the research shows that those youth, if they don't have the support of a permanent family, are um, more likely to experience um, homelessness and unemployment and just other negative outcomes. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that it's it's a cause that not everybody knows about. It's this sort of quiet crisis. And so the data points of these surveys allow us to have conversations um, with the media, um, to be able to educate our supporters about you know, challenges. So we have been commissioning this study uh, every five years um, with an external agency partner since 2001 um, to again, just gauge, does the public know this information? Um, what can we do to change um, hearts and minds? And um, so like two examples I'll give you from the 2022 survey was that, you know, 75% of the public surveyed or that representative um, sample size believe that the public, we should be doing more to uh, support foster care adoption. Mm -hmm. um, and 68% say that if um, their employer provided adoption benefits, they would consider adopting. So those research points kind of tie into our adoption friendly workplace um, study and survey that I mentioned to you. And again, to make that point to employers of, of why um, the those um, benefits are so important. Let me ask you a quick question. Can sure. our viewers and listeners go to your website and find this? Because this is the sort of thing that, um, you know, 1.8 million registered nonprofits <laughs> in America need to be looking at having this benefit as well for their, yep. their teams. 
Um, can they find that to see what that looks like? They sure can. So um, on our website, um, we have a research section um, that highlights a kind of a number of the different reports that we have done over time in those annual ones. Um, and um, the um, best adoption friendly workplace, um, there's that's a, a a program tab that you can see on our website that highlights the toolkit that I mentioned okay. and some of those um, key statistics. And then the, the adoption and foster care attitude survey findings are um, you can find there as well. And a number of our of national um, child welfare organizations across the country go to those and look to that data every year um, or every five years, depending on which survey we're talking about, to be able to make the case for you know the area in which they are supporting the cause. And um, so they're often, you know, citing us as a source. I appreciate, uh, you know, having that research because it seems like a simple add-on benefit for employers. It it seems perhaps, Julianne, and maybe this is what the research concludes, it's simply a lack of education, right? The lack of inclusivity of adding that foster care benefit package onto an already existing family package that might yep. come from, um, you know, a, a birth family. That's right. And, and, and in, um, the, in this research isn't ours, but from another um, HR group, um, not that many um, individuals even take advantage of the benefit. Um, oh, so, you know, I think sometimes yeah. um, there can be this <clears throat> feeling, particularly with smaller organizations of like, gosh, how much can I offer, you know? And so that's where, you um, the the survey data is really important and we um not only have the the reveal of the hundred um best you know who are really giving that top line benefits but also um benchmark reports that show um uh what organizations are doing of different size so small medium large different mm -hmm. industries so that you can compare yourself against your peers um, and figure out what is going to be um you know make the most sense for your organization, but also be able to support your employees and um, attract them, retain them, and really make them feel valued. And that, you know, um, there's no one way to grow your family and that your employer is supporting yeah. of that. Yeah. I love it. Let's, let, let's move into the attitudes, right? Like how do the attitudes, people's attitudes, employers' attitudes, you know, everything really shift and shape your nonprofit mission. What does that look like, Julianne? And, and what are you seeing? Um, so, you know, I can give you examples from a number of, you know, different ways. Um, so um, the Adoption and foster care attitude survey that I mentioned as an example, um, reveal that, you know, 30% of um, uh, the public feels that a teen will be fine on their own. You know, they don't need the support of, of a permanent family. They're almost 18, like wow. they're fine. Um, and only 3% would consider adopting a teen as their first choice. So that significantly impacts our mission because our, in particular, our Wendy's Wonderful Kids program is serving children over the age of nine, sibling groups and children with special needs. And so if the public is thinking, well, that's not really needed, but we know there's 20,000 youth aging out of foster care every year, then we have a challenge. And we mm -hmm. need to work to educate the public and sharing the findings of um, those surveys, which we do in a variety of ways, um, and and also um, educate our supporters about why um, you know their commitment to our cause matters so much to really you know move that needle. Um, another example of research that I'll share, you know, even relates to um, the child welfare professionals who we collaborate with. So we know that um, you know often the youth that they serve um, have experienced significant trauma. Um, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, it's not an easy job to find that right family. And so um, we wanted to know is to, to be able to conduct some research with them to say, what struggles are you finding in your work? Are there any perceived barriers that you're facing? Are there best practices that are a complement to what, um, you know, our program is doing? Um, what type of messages resonate with you? Um, what type of professional learning would you find valuable? And so, you know, it's it's looking at, you know, we engage, you know, the public, we engage child welfare professionals, we engage business professionals, you know, all the different angles. There's so many different roles that play into 
the um, advancement of our mission in this critical work. So, so research is just critical um, in that way um, to, to really advance um, our work. Yes. You know, this is a critical you know, question, but how often are you, do you get research back that's like, holy moly, we didn't know that, or we didn't think that. I mean, how often is this coming back at you and really reinforming your choices as an organization and not just uh, data and metrics that helps you support what it is you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there can be surprises for sure. Um, I mean, in the example of the um, the survey of child welfare professionals that we did, you know, if, if you ask the question, um, you know, do you believe that every child deserves a safe and permanent home? The number's pretty high. But yeah. the, if you ask the question, do you believe every child um, waiting in foster care is adoptable? It's not as high as we'd like to see it. Yeah. And so that's a surprise. And it's not because they don't believe that it's needed. It's, it's, it's the how and how hard it is. Mm -hmm. And so then that helps us to say, okay, what can we do to elevate the profession and help them feel valued? What type of stories and resources can, can support their work and help them make the case um, in their jobs? Um, what type of educational resources, you know, can we put out there? So, so absolutely um, there can be surprises and um, changes in the data over time. And, you know, the yeah. adoption and foster care attitude survey that I mentioned, we do every five years to see how has that trend changed and, Many times there have been celebrations with that, you know, that more families are opening their hearts, to, you know, to adoption. And and so we celebrate that and we share that. But, you know, there is still um, more than 51 percent who believe that children are placed in foster care because they've done something wrong. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. And it, that doesn't mean that they may not have behavioral issues at certain points. That's to be expected from the trauma that they've experienced. But that just demonstrates how much they need um, that support and, um, you know, uh, guidance and um, and resources to overcome that trauma. And then their, their whole world changes around when they have that support. And so we attempt to share that through research findings, but also through storytelling. And so there's a combination of those things that are used together to kind of, again, educate about the urgency of need and the problem, share that story of how a life was changed, but then remind people what the research shows about the number of children who are still waiting and, and what we can do about it. You know, I really commend the organization for all of the research, and you've talked already a little bit about the process, but I'm curious, Julianne, if you can talk to us about the process in particular of the cost and the time. What is that looking like? Yeah, so that is um, a complex question to answer um, <laughs> because... Um, research really comes in all different forms. So, sure. you know, if your goal is to gather feedback from your supporters, for example, about, you know, why they signed up for your emails mm -hmm. or what inspired them to support their mission, um, you know, there are free or low cost tools that you can use from, from Google Forms to SurveyMonkey to gather that um, informal feedback. Um, other like inexpensive forms of research might be if you are testing two different types of an ad um, to see, you know, did a did a message or a visual resonate differently or perform differently? Um, did you send an email in the morning versus the afternoon? Did that impact things? And so those are important types of research that inform your tactical implementation that are kind of lower cost and that you can kind of do in-house. Um, but if you're using the research to um, make a public claim or inform policy decisions, um, engaging a, an external research partner is critical, um, and that has an expense. Um, but it's so important because um, they can help you make sure that the questions you're asking are truly going to accomplish your business goals or inform your business goals um, and prevent any um, unintended bias in the questions. Mm -hmm. So I might think like, this is exactly how I want to say it. And a research partner might say, well, you, if saying it this way is going to lead the answer, like maybe it's going to give you right. what you want to hear, but it's right. not, you know, going to help enough. So again, finding a critical, a, a partner who has experience with the level of rigor of what you're trying to accomplish is mm -hmm. huge. Um, 
And then the cost is again, widely varies depending on, you know, how granular you're going to be and how customized you want to be. So, you know, we have certain surveys um, where we might have a set of questions that we ask every year and we fold them into a pre-existing survey of the public. Um, something like that could be in the, you know, $15,000 range and um, maybe take a couple weeks of analysis. Um, but if you're doing a survey where it involves focus groups and you want to know about findings from, you know, different roles in different states um, and more qualitative data, um, that could take, you know, three to six months. And sometimes what we've done is um, conduct a quantitative survey um, and get the analysis from our research partner and talk through that and say, okay, we want to probe deeper in these particular areas. And so we want to conduct, you know, Zoom interviews with a representative sample of individuals who are going to help us get that. And that could be, you know, 50,000, 250,000. It could be, it could be multi-year. So it's hard to answer the question because it really depends. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what I would say is that um, that's where having that external partner if it is something that is going to make a major um, policy or programmatic decision, um, that would be really important. And, and sometimes you're not the one to conduct it. You know, we also right. can, in some cases, grant fund uh, organizations who are conducting research, like they'll reach out to us and say, hey, we want to know about this. And we're like, we want to know about that too. So <laughs> this is in alignment with our strategic priorities. And you, you're going to lead that with an external partner. And we're going to, you know, work with you to think about the implications of what it reveals and think about the ways that we can also promote that, you know, around our shared goals. Well, I appreciate your insight on, you know, it could be as simple as testing two different advertisements, right? All the way to bringing in a third party, you know, a person or company that's really going to facilitate that. And there's, there's really no right or wrong, I think, when it comes to research. I think any and all research is very helpful. But what do we do with it afterwards, right? So we, we've conducted this research. We've perhaps invested, you know, thousands of dollars and perhaps multi-years. How do we take that research to change the attitudes? And the one that I'm stuck on, Julianne, is really the one that's like, you know, our assumption is that children are in foster care because they've done something yeah. wrong, right? Like how yeah. do we change the mind and that attitude, you know, and there's yeah. so many assumptions, I think, when it comes to a lot of different social challenges, how have you used this research to change those attitudes? That's a great question. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say this is one that is a multi-channel multi-partner over yeah. time never ends that at least that particular question you asked yeah. um, but I think it's true of, of, of research in general when it's something you're talking about attitudes and behavioral change it's not something you can kind of do overnight and you have to ask key questions sometimes about who's the right messenger to share what you're wanting to articulate right yeah. So we um, develop integrated marketing and communications plans, collaborating with our development team, collaborating with our program team, our business development team, you know, all the people who are out in the field who are engaging with different audiences who have some influence and support of the youth and families who we serve. Um, what we have really found is that um, a storytelling approach um, is among the most powerful tools in your toolbox. Mm -hmm. And so we very carefully um, welcome uh, youth and families um, who have adopted through foster care, um, employers who have um, uh, become adoption-friendly workplaces, yeah. employees who've taken advantage of those to share how it's changed their life. And we um, launch public service announcements that we run every year through um, TV, radio, um, billboards, um, blogs, um, and very often, again, to that particular point that you were making, um, it's the voice of a 17-year-old girl sharing that right. she was weeks away from uh, aging out without a permanent family, that she had given up hope 
that this was ever going to be a possibility for her and how adoption changed her life and how, wow. you know, without that could have ended up on the streets and not had the support raises. And that's the reality that it, again, we know from others, external research of what happens. And so where we can share that story through the public service announcement, through their voice, through ads, through social sharing and kind of identifying influencers in the field who have larger networks than ours <laughs> to be able to say, you know, um, yeah. hey, can you believe that this is what people think? And we want you to hear this story and we want you to help tell people about it. Just, you know, and then that translates through um, earned media and reaching out to reporters to educate them. And it translates into the distribution of adoption guides that we create and you know, other resources to really help people think about it. And even sharing, um, you know, maybe a parent who did adopt that team and say, you know, I never thought about it before, or I didn't know that this child was in foster care. I didn't even know that was a possibility that I could adopt them, but I can, and I can be that, that support person for that, that child. And I can encourage another person to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we definitely use, you know, multiple channels and, you know, um, making sure that we're sharing best practices that we've learned over the years and through that research to continue, um, continue advocating for the advancement of our mission and why investing in our national awareness campaigns and the advancement of our programs is just so, so critical um, for an issue that just is not talked about enough. And it's just, it's different than a cause that is sort of, and I'm not saying that not all causes are important, um, but when it's like a disaster relief and it's in the news and it's right now and you can totally relate to it or some something that every family has experienced um, it's just a different thing. And in this case, it may be something that every family has experienced in some way or knows someone who's adopted, um, but maybe not talk, talked about as much. Um, and again, so those are those are why we take that, um, you know, multi-channel, long game approach um, to moving the needle for our mission. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, it's needed, right? To, to be repetitive, to be consistent, to share that education. I just commend, honestly, you, the entire team, Julianne, of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. We are so grateful to have, I think we have four different representatives joining us this week and uh, a special nonprofit Power Week, our, our third annual. And the reason for that is really to bring education, you know, to the sector, to their communities across the globe about the benefits of, of adoption and foster care. So Julian Nichols has joined us today, Vice President of Marketing as well as Communications of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Really thrilled to have you here. Mm. For everyone that's uh, interested in learning more or looking up that research that Julian mentioned, go to DaveThomasFoundation.org. Um, fantastic website that provides yeah. so much information, but take a look there. You can hear, you can see, you can read these stories, that storytelling that Julianne was sharing with us today. Mm -hmm. I know I always spend extra time on your website as well as at Wendy's because it just, you know, it's just a great fit. Really <laughs> so is. thank you, Julianne, for all that you do and to share this wonderful topic. You've been phenomenal to kick off this nonprofit power week. Just so grateful to have this dedicated week with you and your colleagues. Well, thank you so much. It just, you're, this is another example of, um, an important voice um, to shine a light on, on our mission. And, and there are various ways to get involved. We hope it's in attracting uh, um, people to become adoptive parents. But again, if you go to our website, lots of ways to help. So thank you so much for the opportunity. You know, yeah. it, this week is going to be really interesting because there's so much going on. We're going to be talking about experiencing trauma and then staying in the environment, working for the nonprofit sector, when maybe you have a backstory that's just really tough. Yep. Um, we're gonna also be talking about the realities of founder syndrome, and I can't <laughs> wait to do that with, with Rita. Again, testing your marketing plan is gonna be kind of an adjunct to this and how we actually 
look at the different ways we can understand how our work is, is uh, navigating us towards our mission, vision, and values. Again, today we talked about researching and changing attitudes. And then on Friday, we're going to wrap it up with an ask and answer with Rita Sorn and the CEO and president of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I've been joined today by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, Nonprofit Power Week is a special thing. We only do it a couple times a year, and we have the ongoing support of Fundraising Academy at National University, Bloomerang, Your Part-Time Controller, American Nonprofit Academy, Tech Talk, Nonprofit Nerd, and Staffing Boutique. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Wow, you know, Julianne, you really kicked us off in a meaningful <laughs> way for the whole week, and I suspect, Jarrett, that we're going to be weaving back some of her comments as we move oh, forward yeah. every day, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah, we typically do. And I always learn so very much um, from these conversations. Last year, Juliana, I was serving as a professional interim CEO for an organization. I was so grateful to help bring some of the foster care and adoption benefits to the policies that had previously never been part of that before. Oh, and again, wonderful. I wouldn't have known about it if it weren't for the show. So thank well, you. Well, together we're stronger. So thank you so yeah. much for that connection. And I, I'm grateful to hear that those resources were helpful. You know, yeah. it's it's amazing. And, and again, this is only day one of a full week. So join us back um, every day. And if you can't join us live, you can certainly... Uh, connect with us on our archives um, and we hope that you do because I think this is really a powerful nonprofit power week. So as we end every episode, we like to leave with this mantra. And again, it means a lot of things. It means something different every day when we say it, but especially it resonates, I think this month as we celebrate the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. And it goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.